and TV ministry. It was back in about 1983. And when the Lord told me to go on TV, it was supernatural. Back in them days, it was $250 for a half an hour program. And at that time, the church, the Lord told me, you, you're going to pay for it. The church won't. And God did. He did supernaturally. Eventually, we ended up on seven TV stations, satellite. And, of course, now we do everything by Internet and modern technology, YouTube channels and stuff. But uh, it cost me $250 for a half an hour program that was showed one time, and that was almost 40 years ago. Now, do you realize we live in a day and age, it doesn't really cost you anything to get the word of God out there globally And that's not just one time. It's up there. It's archived. I mean, isn't God amazing? I mean, 250 bucks for a half an hour 40 years ago. And now we can put our programming out there. I I think I just threw a video up there last night. And I think it has almost 200 people that watched it. I mean, I know that's not a lot. But it's a big it's 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 we're putting word out there, aren't we? And it's global people. It's global. So we know that we're living in the last times. We know that Jesus, I mean, Peter, Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, perilous times will come. And he gives you a description. And listen, we, we are in a time as we get closer to the end. Just realize this. I'm not gloom and doom. It is going to get goofy. Why should we be shocked or surprised? It is going to get wild. You better put your seatbelts on, your seatbelt of faith. You better pick up your shoe of faith. And we're in the midst of this. Now, a lot of times, I think a lot of people thought we were going to be raptured out before all the craziness happened. I didn't really see that in the scriptures. I think we're going to see a lot of craziness before we're taken out. And actually, the Bible says it's almost symbolic of the birthing pains of a woman with a child. Now, just seven months ago, uh, my daughter-in-law, uh, Catherine Yuli, uh, And when she gave birth to our precious little granddaughter, let me tell you, that was a precarious day. They were wanting her to be given birth on the 18th because that's my birthday and my daughter's birthday, February the 18th. Now it's been seven months. Uh, But thank God she was born on the 17th because on the 18th we had a terrible ice storm, terrible. But I tell you what, man, that day that she was given birth, I'm telling you what, uh, I mean, the mother was in big, big trouble. Because the baby was breached. And then she began to bleed. And they couldn't stop the bleeding. And I tell you, we stood, we, I mean, we wrestled. I wrestled in the spirit. I prayed. I know a lot of you were praying with us, crying out to God, taking a hold of God, looking like we we're going to lose uh, 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 Catherine and lose uh, uh, little Serafina. It looked like we we're going to lose them. But God turned it all around and that's why we got to look to God people don't don't be moved by what it looks like right now because it don't look good and don't even look at it get your eyes on Jesus Christ and and that's the Lord told me I repented of it already I mean I took a busload of you down there to DC and I was out there shouting stop the steal stop the steal at the top of my lungs all day long I thought it was the Holy Ghost it wasn't it was flesh and the Lord said to me he said, what are you doing son he said you're not wrestling flesh and blood did you know I found a king that says uh, the, the, the multitudes will not save the king did you know that the multitudes were not, I mean, there was multitudes trying to save our last president. It didn't work. You know where our hope is, our confidence is, our trust is? It's in Jesus Christ. So it's going to get, listen, before everything is said and done, it's like a woman in travail right now. Before this baby comes forth, before the manifestation of the sons of God comes forth, before it's all said and done, it is really going to get weird. I mean, strange. So what do we do? We keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. I'm not preaching a message of gloom and doom because our hope is in Jesus Christ. Our life is in Jesus Christ. Our eternity is in Jesus Christ. I think that's why in the last couple of weeks, the Lord's really had me study the subject of heaven. I'm not preaching on that tonight. But when God created the heavens and the earth, that was before the solar system, the galaxy, and the universe. He created the, 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 the heavenly heavens in the very beginning 
because he knew he was going to populate it. And after the resurrection of Jesus, he's begun to populate it, people. Everybody from, from that believed in the coming of Christ up to Christ up to now that has died is now walking the golden streets of the new Jerusalem right now. Right now, they're eating off of the tree of life. Right now, they're, they're swimming in the river of life. Right now, they're having a, a, a time of their life that we could never imagine. And, and so, uh, you know, don't get hopeless. Uh, because really, the worst thing that anybody could do to us is kill us. That's it. What a threat. Going to send me to Jesus. <laughs> what a threat. Yeah, go ahead and send me to Jesus. Well, but pastor, why do we hang around? Because God's not done yet. God, God's going to use us to bring many into the kingdom, to disciple them, to burp them, to, 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 to bottle feed them, and to change their diapers. Ain't that exciting? You know, I forgot it was, what it was like to have little ones and two Seraphina came along and the oh God help. <laughs> but you know, this morning we're uh, begin there and we didn't get very far in Ezekiel 37 where it's talking about the valley of dead bones. We're not going there tonight. We're going to the book of Revelation chapter 19. But this morning we're talking about a v valley full of dead bones, which was symbolic of the house of Israel that had been scattered, destroyed. Uh, the, Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. Everything. In their culture was destroyed. And it looked like there was no hope, no future. And But Jeremiah prophesied in 70 years, he said, God will gather you together and bring you back. And you know what? God did it. Well, I just found out this morning, I didn't know this. Somebody, my daughter told me that a guy was preaching and he mentioned that from the time that Israel became a nation up until the time that finally Jerusalem was declared to be its capital was 70 years. Did you know that Trump did that? When Trump declared Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, it was 70 years. Now, I think there's something symbolic about that. I really do think we're getting close. I think that's what we're seeing. I think we're seeing the devil lose it. I think we're seeing the devil panic. I think we're seeing the enemy. He knows. He knows the, the, the manifestation of the sons of God is about to happen. And, and in Ezekiel 37, when the valley full of dead bones, and he said to the prophet, can they live? And he says, Lord, thou knowest. He, he, he knew there was no way that that army could ever live again without God's divine intervention. I tell you, the body, the bride, the church can, will never be what God's called it to be without God's divine intervention. God's going to have to do this. And I've, I've got good news for you. God is going to do it. God is going to do it. God is going to bring together his bride. She's going to be without spot or blemish or wrinkle or any such thing. And matter of fact, we want to jump into the future tonight. And I don't know how many years this is into the future. But let's just go into the future in Revelation chapter 19. And we can see the fulfilling of this promise. God is, you know, God promised the day would come when the seed of the woman would come and crush the head of the serpent. How I many you know what happened? God promised the day would come when the Messiah would suddenly come to his house. How I many you know that happened? God promised the day that a, 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 a man would rise up and he would heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, cast out devils, and raise the dead. God prophesied the day would come when a man would take, who was God himself, Emmanuel, would take our place on a cross and take our sins and die for us. But he would rise again like Jonah coming out of the belly of the fish in three days. I mean, no, it's already happened. I tell you, take, take great hope. Everything God said is going to happen. It's not going to look like it's going to happen. It's not look like it. It's going to look, whoa, really, really bad. But God's going to show up. Yeah. And God's going to show up and show off in his bride. When I say bride, listen, I'm going to tell you something in love. In spite of it, uh, God never meant there to be all these different denominations in the church. He really did. Actually, God's plan was for every community to have one local body who were completely yielded, surrendered, submitted, and given over to him. Wouldn't that have been wonderful? But it didn't happen that way. The enemy came to, to what? To divide us and to conquer. 
But it's okay. God is about to do something awesome. Can you shout amen? Amen. So uh, look here in verse 5 of of Revelation chapter 19. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a mighty thundering saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God, God omnipotent reigneth. He's not going to reign, he reigneth. I mean, multitudes of voices in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! The Lord our God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad. Do what? Let us be sad. No, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For Listen, why? For the marriage of the Lamb is come. It's going to happen, people. The marriage is coming for the bride and her groom. And his wife hath made herself ready. Tell somebody, he's he's talking about me. Now you say, I'm a man, I can't say that. No, no, come on, man, just say it. He's talking about me. The bride has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, now listen to these. Hey, why, why would he, he shouldn't have to say this, but he just really, really wants you to believe this. He saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God. What? The bride has made herself ready. The marriage of the Lamb has come. And she will be clothed in fine linen. These words, say these words, these, these are, say these are the true sayings of God. These are the true sayings of It's going to happen, beloved. And we don't know what the time frame is. I think it's really getting pretty, pretty close. I really do. Remember all of this began, and I began to share a little bit this morning. It all began in the book of Genesis. When God said this, listen, what God said in Genesis 2.18. And the Lord God said, it is not good for that the man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from him made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Now, we know that's the first Adam. How many know there's a second Adam? The second Adam is Jesus Christ. That was all symbolic of Jesus and his people. God is going to have a bride. Jesus is going to have a bride that is in love with him. Head over heels. I mean, without blemish, without spot, without wrinkle, without any flaws. Listen to this. This has got to be God. No flaws, no hang-ups, no hiccups, (laughs) no flesh, pure spirit. Tell somebody he's talking about me. Tell him he's talking about you. I mean, come on, I know in the natural we look in the mirror and we go, oh, God, I'm such a mess. And and, and it's not a bad confession, it's just recognition, but God, you're going to make me without spot or blemish or wrinkle or any such thing. You're going to do it, God. You're going to, now, brother, you're not going to make your wife that way. You cannot make your wife without spot or blemish or wrinkle. Matter of fact, how's it been going for you, brother Charles? I mean, how many years have you been trying to make D perfect? Does it work? And vice versa. And vice versa. God's got to do it. Tell, tell her, God's got to do it, honey. Say, say, now, come on, Charles. Say to your wife, I give up. Say, I give up. God's got to do it. Amen. <laughs> We're not called to mold and shape one another. We're not called to change one another. All the hammering, all the harping, all of the nagging, all of the, you know, picking, all of the scripture quoting to your mate is not going to change them. If anything, it's probably going to do a lot of harm. Because I, I, I did it to my wife for years. And, and when I finally stopped, she got better looking. <laughs> and she became nicer and sweeter. When I finally said, okay, God, 
She's your woman. She's your daughter. She's the daughter of Zion. Uh, you, you made her. You, you, you started the product. You started the process. Now, Father, please finish it. <laughs> and my wife, she prays the same way for me. Don't you, baby doll? Say, God, please get a hold of that man. Please go to hold of that man. And, and it says that, and the rib which God, the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her on to man. Now, we know this goes right along with Ephesians, you know, and it goes, and Adam said, this is now, <clears throat> excuse me, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Uh, and she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And, and in Ephesians, it says almost exactly the same. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church. Say, that's my job, is to love my wife as Christ loves the church. Now, now how many know it cost Jesus his life? I mean, it, he went through a lot of pain. He went through a lot of misery. He went through a lot of torment. He was made sin. Now, we don't have to be made sin for our wives. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Now listen, we, we got to realize that to some extent the church, if, how many of you have ever read the book of Hosea? I do not like the book of Hosea. I just don't like it. It's true. But in the book of Hosea, God visits Hosea and tells him to marry a woman of whoredom. Uh, Gomer. What a name. I want you. God told him. He said, I want you to marry Gomer. And she, she's basically a prostitute, a harlot. He said, and she is, listen, she is symbolic of my people that I'm going to redeem. No, I didn't preach this this morning because I want to live. I want to leave you in a high attitude. But the Bible says. You adulterers and adulteresses, knowing not that friendship with the world is enmity with God, therefore who shall be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. I, I, you know what a harlot is? She sells herself for money or for things. I'm telling you, I believe right now to a great extent, the church is a harlot. I believe we have sold our inheritance. We've sold ourselves. We've given ourselves to the world for momentary pleasures. Now, you and I look at that and we'd say, and and can you imagine what Hosea went through? Man, if I was a prophet of God, I'm a holy prophet. Remember, holy men of old spake as everyone would about, he's a holy man of God. He's probably a virgin. I guarantee he's probably a virgin. Been preparing his, his whole life has been preparing to prophesy the word of the Lord. And the very beginning of the book, and God appears to him and says, okay, Hosea, I've got your assignment. What is it, Lord? I want you to go down. You see that, that prostitute, that harlot, that whore? That's what he said. Uh, Gomer? Yeah? Marry her. What? Marry her. I don't want to marry her. Only God knows what kind of disease that she's got, how many men she's been with, how messed up. Now, I, I know you wouldn't like this part of the message. I knew this. So, but I want you to marry her. Well, why? Well, he said, she won't be faithful to you. She won't be committed to you. She's going to cheat on you numerous times. But I want to use her as an example. Your relationship with her I want to use it as an example of my relationship with my people. And here, here, here's the whole story. He never gave up on her. He kept on providing for her, protecting for her, pr- praying for her, standing in the gap for her, reaching out to her, loving her, because it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. And I'm telling you, before God gets done, the church which has acted like a harlot and a whore, would become holy, separated, consecrated, and in love with her husband, head over heels. And he will embrace us. And throughout eternity, he will never bring up our past. (laughs) 
mean, to me, this is overwhelming. See, because I'm talking about Mike Yeager. How many times have I been, how, how many times since I've been saved have I given myself to things of the world, ideals, desires, longings, and I never went to the Father about it? I just made up my mind. This is what I want. This is what I'm going to do. That's what a harlot does. I'm just going to do what I want to do. And yet God, in his infinite mercy and grace and long-suffering and forbearance and kindness, has forgiven me more times. I mean, my sins, if you, because anything that is not a faith is sin. And my sins, since I've been saved, has been piled as high as a mountain. And yet when I confess it and repent of it, he's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Give the Lord a hand clap and a shout. That's how, now, God doesn't mean God condones sin, but I'll tell you one thing it did. If you don't think it brought pain and suffering in Hosea's, I believe God put love in Hosea's heart for that woman. I really do. And Hosea's heart was ripped and torn and hurt over and over, but he kept on, because like, just like God, he said in all their afflictions, he was afflicted. That's what God said. In all of their troubles, he was with them. And you know, God's been with you and me in all of our difficulties, in all of our hardships, in all of our sinfulness, in all that we've done to him. And he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. You know, I know people miss. See, that's really what Romans chapter 8, what was separated us from the love of God, what they don't understand is that you can walk away. God won't walk away from you. You, will walk, you can walk away from God and go out into the world. And God, listen, Hosea never stopped Gomer. God never told him, stop her from going out with another man. No, he never stopped her. God won't stop you. You want to live in the world? You want to act like the world? You want to do what the world does? God will let you go even to the point. I tell you, God will love you. God loves you so much. If you decide to forsake him and go to hell, he will let you. Now, he's going to do all he can to persuade you otherwise. He'll be knocking on your door. Behold, I say at the door knock. And remember, he's talking to the church. He's outside of the church. In Revelation 3, Jesus is outside of his own house. How many men, men have ever been locked out of your house? Because our heart is his heart. Our heart is his house. And he's outside of us. And I'm the house of God. I'm the temple of the living God. And, and Jesus is outside of his house that he bought, he paid for with his blood, and he even made, and he's knocking on the door of my heart, which is his house. And he said, if you will hear my voice, if you will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into you and sup with you and you with me. Now, now come on, it'd be hard for me if God had me marry a harlot. And uh, she's got my house, and I'm knocking on her door, and she finally lets me in for me to sit down and eat and drink with her, bring all my groceries, and not bring up what she's been doing. <laughs> but God said, let me in, and I'm not going to drag up your past. I'm not going to rub your face in it. He said, I'll forgive you. Now, of course, there's repentance involved in this. So don't think I'm preaching you can just live any way you want without repentance. You got to repent. Say repent. repent. So go back just for a moment to the fact that the woman was made from the man. Listen, all of, if you could have medically studied Eve and her DNA, it would have all been Adam. Everything in Eve was from Adam. There was no mixture, no other DNA. No animal DNA. We, we did not come from monkeys. We did not crawl from a deep slurpy slop out of some swamp somewhere. We didn't come from any bird or any fish. The woman was pure DNA of Adam. So I'm telling you, before God gets done, the bride of Christ will be the pure DNA of Jesus Christ. Oh, man, I can't even grasp that. Pure DNA of Jesus Christ. When we get to right now, the saints that are in heaven, who knows how many millions, 
their DNA. Now, I know they have spiritual bodies, which are just as real. When I had an angel of the Lord take me to heaven at 19 years old, I don't think I was in my physical body, but it sure felt like it was. And, it, and the physical world was more real to me than the, the spiritual world was more real to me than the natural world. The colors, the sights. Now, I didn't eat anything there, but the smells, the sounds, the sights, uh, everything. It was so much alive. And actually, it was so real that after I got back from heaven, uh, everything seemed dull and dim to me. Not, not, in heaven, it was like awesome, three-dimensional. It was so clear, so vivid, so alive, so, so I cannot. It, it, I'm a, he must have dropped me in the Garden of Eden before I stood before the throne of glass and I saw God upon the throne. And he spoke to me and I fell as a dead man. He showed me the coming harvest. He showed me the coming in gathering of the last great harvest of all the nations and all the kindreds and all the tongues. And it was suddenly, boom. Suddenly, I'm telling you, that's what's going to happen to the bride. Suddenly, she will be transformed. Suddenly, she will be changed. It said that in Romans. It says that all of creation is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Well, some years later, I got married, and Kathy and I, you know, we, we, we'd be going places. And, um, and, and from that time from to the, up to the time where my wife would say to me, honey, because I, I, I'd be going through Chicago, and here's this big old sign. And I'd say, baby, what does that sign say? And she'd say, you need glasses. You need glasses. I said, I don't need no glasses, you know. <laughs> but I needed glasses. But see, part of that came from the fact that when I went to heaven, everything was so vivid, so real, so alive, that when I came back into my physical body, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, everything was dead I can't I can't explain it to you when I went to heaven everything was alive everything the grass the flowers I mean and everything sounded like a I could hear everything I could hear the butterflies flapping their wings I I, I could hear the birds singing I I could hear uh, the bear slurping the water in the river I could I could I could it was like but it was like music it wasn't confusion and everything was vivid and alive and when I came back from that experience everything I looked at visibly and audibly was dead and so when my wife tried to convince me that I, I needed glasses, she couldn't for a while because of the fact that I said, no, no, it's just things aren't as vivid as they were when I was in heaven. <laughs> well, I finally eventually did get glasses. And then I began to believe God through the years, Lord. I, I would stand in the back and I could not read the words up on the screen without my glasses on. And uh, so I, I just began. I don't know how I did it. Just about 10 years ago, I just began to say, Lord, I thank you. My eyesight is back. I thank you. My eyesight is vivid. I thank you, God. And now I can read everything clearly without my glasses. If I put my glasses on, everything gets blurred. <laughs> Amen. Well, why would God heal your eyes and not my eyes? You haven't been believing God for them, have you? That's why. There's a lot of things I'm not believing God for, and I should be believing God for. How many know that God has many promises for you, but you got to take a hold of them? I mean, you got to claim them. And, and there's people who will claim certain promises and not other promises. And you'll claim this promise, and you'll have wonderful testimonies because you claim the promise. And see, all of these promises is God. Listen to me. It's the wedding gift that Jesus has given to you. Healing is a wedding gift. Deliverance is a wedding gift. Do you know I even believe the fruits of the Spirit are God, the gifts of Jesus to his bride. You know, I, I, he wants his bride to have lots of joy, right? So he says, I want my bride to have some joy. Be joyful. <laughs> I, want my, I don't want a sad bride. I want my bride to be full of love. So I'm going to give her some love. I want my bride to be full of peace. Uh, you're a pretty good looking bride. Lord, give them peace. <laughs> I want my bride to be full of patience and kindness and gentleness and meekness and long suffering and forbearance and self control. And these are gifts that God has given to you. Did you know repentance is a gift? Don't kick away repentance. When God, matter of fact, in Hebrews 12, it says, when you're chastised, you ought to rejoice because it means you're legitimate. God don't chastise those who aren't his people. 
You know, just like if you had a child acting up, I'm not coming over to spank your child. That's your child. And if God disciplines you and corrects you and convicts you, you ought to grab that. I'm so glad that God convicts me. I'm glad that God, now, of course, uh, God's going to bring conviction, but then the devil is going to try to bring misery. So don't let, the, don't let the devil take you from conviction into condemnation. You got to forgive yourself. Amen. And so the bride is going to have the DNA of heaven. Now, the cry of my heart for the last couple of weeks has really been for the body of Christ. Tonight, I, I, I ran off a sheet of pra- a paper that with all kinds of prayers in the church for the church. And that's what we were praying for an hour tonight. We we're praying for the body of Christ globally. Asking God to give her a spirit of wisdom and revelation and understanding of him. That they would have enlightenment in, 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 in the knowledge of the revelation of Christ. So that's how we are praying. But Jesus prayed an amazing prayer for his bride in John 17, uh, 21. That they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and has loved them as thou hast loved me. Notice the very last thing Jesus prayed before he's headed to the cross. He's going to be betrayed in chapter 18 by Judas. His disciples are going to run from him. And the very last thing he does is he prays for his beloved bride. His beloved bride. I, I, you know, at this moment, I just, it's hard for me to conceive that the day will come when I'm going to just leave this old earthly, it's called this mortality, we'll put on immortality, and this corruption will put on incorruption. And I'll be changed like a caterpillar into a butterfly throughout eternity. But it's real, people. Remember, we just said, read, these words are true and faithful. The bride will be making herself ready and there will be a marriage table and those who die loving Christ will be at that marriage table. Will you reach up and grab that tonight? That's going to be you and I. And the sufferings that we are going through in this life right now, whatever it may be, and I know there's a lot of suffering, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of us have been, you know, feel like we've been pulled through a knot hole, they used to say. Been to hell and back. But I tell you what, what we've been through, sister, is nothing compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. So don't give up, Jenny. Never give up. I just hear the Lord tell me to say that. My daughter, never give up. Never give up. Never give up. The devil wants us to give up. But just spit in his face. And say, I'm not giving. Matter of fact, I'm just going to hang around to make you miserable, devil. You know, even if God gives me an opportunity to come home, I think I'm just going to hang around to make you miserable. Okay, so what's another 10, 15 years of misery in this earth? I'm just going to make you miserable. Amen. And uh, so there, there is this, 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 that what God is doing inside of us. And I know that right now the, the church is far from God's plan, but we can see what God's plan is by looking at the book of Acts. And the latter house is going to be greater than the former house. That's another thing I can't comprehend. It's not talking about the natural temple. Listen, the Jewish people are never going to be able to build a temple like Solomon built. Do you know how much gold was in that? You know how much silver was in that? You know how many precious Jews were that? And they're never going to do that again. So it couldn't be talking about the natural house. It's got to be talking about the church of God. The latter house would be greater than the former house. That's got to be the body. Now, here's what's really, and I believe really that. How many know that God likes to shock people? He really does. He likes to surprise people. He likes to just show, what do you think he did to the whole world through Pharaoh in Egypt? Man, he shocked them. I mean, the Red Sea, come on. The Red Sea standing up on the end and congealing, and they walked across and dry side land? All of the Nile River and all the drinking water of the Egyptians turned to blood? Come on, fire and hail coming down at the same time? You ought to read the book of Revelation. God is going to really shock and awe this world. 
And if you look at all the plagues, you know, the four horses and, and the seven trumpets and the seals, you know, all of that is, you know what that's all designed to do? To get the world to repent. That's how much God wants. He said, I'd have all men everywhere to repent and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. But they won't repent. I mean, no matter how many plagues. And then you got the two the olive branches. They're the two prophets. They come and they begin to call down fire from heaven. And, and they begin to call plagues and whatever they want to do. And they begin to torture all of humanity. I mean, these two guys, man, who do you think they are? I think they're Elijah and Enoch because neither one of them died. I could be wrong, but Elijah and Enoch never died. And it says, give it on a man once to die and then the judgment. They never died. Maybe it's not. I don't care. I know I'm not none of those guys and neither are you. <laughs> I, I've known two men in my life who literally listened to a lying spirit and told them they were Elijah. And both of their lives ended tragically. William Branham got to believe in he was Elijah, and his life ended tragically. I'm telling you, you are not the prophet Elijah, Brother Pete. <laughs> Can you accept that? <laughs> and neither are you, Charles. And neither, neither are you, Brother Ray. You're not Elijah. You hear me? Oh, come on. <laughs> or Enoch, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so guys, after service, we're going to get around Ray. We're going to cast that devil out of him. <laughs> no, we're not. I'm telling you, we're not. So I don't want, but these guys are going to just, you think, listen, you think the devil's made you miserable. God is going to turn the devil's crowd into pure misery. He is just going to torment these guys, you know, for a number of years. And they finally, when they finally die, the whole world rejoices. They throw a humongous party. And then on the third day, God spoils their party. And they all watch them rise up from the dead in the streets of Jerusalem. And they will ascend to heaven. Woo, glory. It's going to get wild, people. I'm glad I'm on the right side. How about you? I wouldn't want to be on the other side. It may look like they're winning now, but they're not. They're a bunch of losers. They're a bunch of losers. And um, so what kind of church is Jesus coming back for as we get ready to close? A holy church, a submitted church, an obedient church, a committed church, a faithful church, a church in love with him, head over heels, a church sold out and dedicated to God's will, a church full of truth, full of the word, full of revelation, full of faith, full of love, full of joy, full of peace, full of power, full of revelation knowledge, full of God's goodness, full of patience, full of light, teachable, humble, meek, surrendered, a church that cries out from the innermost being, not my will, but let thy will be done. <laughs> Grab that tonight. Do you want to be that kind of church? You know, now how is God going to do this? Well, first of all, Ephesians 3.20 now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. God can do this, people. And God will do this. Second Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Jeremiah thirty two twenty seven. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Jude 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. And to prevent you, to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Grab these truths. These are promises. God said, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. And to present you faultless, faultless, pure, holy before him, the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. In Ephesians 1.19, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to this working of his mighty power? Jeremiah 32.17, our Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm. There is nothing, there is nothing, there is nothing too hard for thee. Lord, nothing. You can transform me instantly. And I say, Lord, do it. I say, Lord, do it. Transform me. 
change me. Romans 16, 25, last verse. Now to him that is a power, now of him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret since the world began. Now to him that is, that is a power to establish you according to my gospel. Paul said, now unto God who's able to take what I've been preaching and teaching and declaring and he's able to perform it. He will do it. He will do it. Let's reach our hands towards heaven. Father, we accept your word as the absolute truth. And we surrender and submit and yield to nobody but you. And Lord, we say have your way, have your will in our lives in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen.